Associate Professor in the Division of Social Science and the Division of Public Policy. I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Professor Ben Martin. Uh, professor Martin is a Professor of Science and Technology Policy Studies at the uh, Sussex Policy Research Unit, SPRU, where he served as a director from 1997 to 2004. He is also an Associate Fellow at the Centre for Science and Policy and a Research Associate at the Centre for Business Research, Judge Business School, both at the University of Cambridge. He has carried out research for over 30 years in the field of science policy. He helped to establish techniques for evaluating scientific laboratories, research programs, and national scientific performance. He has also pioneered the notion of technology foresight. Professor Martin has also published several papers on research misconduct, and since 2004 he has been the editor of an increasingly prestigious journal, Research Policy, and he's also the 1997 winner of the Desola Prize the Solar Price Medal for Science Studies. So could you please join me in welcoming Professor Martin, who will be talking about emerging challenges. Thank you, Professor Martin. Thank you, Professor Martin. Thank you very much, Navaha, and thanks for the university and the institute for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to come back to Hong Kong. I've been coming since, the first time was 1979, so I've probably come 20 or so times in the intermediate period. Every time I come, something has changed. Uh, and this is clearly a very dynamic period of uh, Hong Kong history. Anyway, I'm here today to talk about challenges for the field of science policy and innovation studies. Um, the structure of the talk, well, first of all, innovation is increasingly important for economic and social development uh, in a rapidly changing world. That was reflected, I think, in yesterday's talk by Carrie Lam, saying that Hong Kong has to give greater priority to science, technology, and innovation, and making financial measures to encourage that. This then poses challenges for science policy and innovation studies, the field in which I work, and I'll give you a definition of that in a minute. So the question is how to identify those challenges, and my starting point for that was something that happened just over 100 years ago, the famous mathematician Hilbert set about a similar challenge for mathematics. How could one identify the emerging challenges for the field of mathematics? And in turn, my starting point for that is a little bit of history. What have we achieved in, well, my field has been going for about 50 years now. What have been the major advances during that time? And I'll give you a brief list of those. And then set about trying to identify some challenges for future generations of researchers in this field over the next few decades, and then end with a few concluding remarks. So this is David Hilbert at the International Congress of Mathematicians in Paris in 1990, uh, sorry, 1900. Who of us would not be glad to lift the veil behind which the future lies hidden to cast a glance at the next advances of our field, the sequence of development, what particular goals will be, and so on. So that was his starting point for setting out what became 23 challenges for mathematicians, which then led to a lot of work over the, uh, much of the 20th century as they strove to answer his, his challenges. So can one identify a set of challenges for science policy and innovation studies? They need to be quite difficult to set targets, sufficiently difficult to entice us, but not completely impossible to, to carry out. Um, and arguably, it's harder to do it in our field of science policy and innovation studies than in mathematics because we're more subject to unpredictable external influences as the world changes. We'll come to that later on. I should stress at the start, many of the challenges I identify are not new. People have already spotted them, even begun work on them. But what I try to do is bring them together in a systematic and rigorous way. In order to achieve that, we first need to construct some robust viewing platform to, 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 to look into the future. And given the importance of continuity and path dependence, these are key terms in, in many fields at present, the past may offer clues to future directions. Where we come from influences where we go to in the future, in other words. So here's a definition of the field for those of you not familiar with it. Economic, policy, management and organisational studies. So we're drawing on a broad range of social sciences, of science, technology and innovation, STI, with a view to providing useful inputs to decision makers concerned with policies for and the management of science, technology and innovation. Uh, and I should, as an aside, say this means that we are somewhat separate from our neighbours in a field called science and technology studies. These are the sociologists, historians and philosophers of science. 
um, and I see my field as somewhat separate from that. Our primary, in particular, because our primary focus is on policy and management issues. What are the issues that decision makers, for example, in Hong Kong are currently uh, wrestling with? So that's the starting point rather than academic theory. The work is intrinsically interdisciplinary, drawing upon sociologists, economists, political scientists, and a range of scientists and engineers, historians, so a whole range of fields. Uh, and for those uh, familiar with the jargon, we are intrinsically mode two rather than mode one. I haven't got time to go into that at present. And over the last 50 years, the field has grown from half a dozen or so people studying innovation in the late 1950s to several thousand a day. So it's a significant field of activity in business school, economic faculties, and so on around the world. In another paper, I set out to identify 20 advances we've made over the last 50 years, and here's the summary. So moving from a notion of individual entrepreneurs to more corporate innovation activities, from laissez-faire to government intervention, that's I think the issue that Hong Kong is wrestling with at present, from two factors of production, labour and capital, to three, with technology innovation as the third, uh, from some of the others from single factor to multi-factor explanations of innovation, from static to dynamic models of innovation, um, from neoclassical to evolutionary economics, um, from optimizing firm to resource-based view of the firms. For those of you familiar with management, resource-based view of the firm is one of the uh, favorite uh, theoretical perspectives. From individual actors to systems of innovation, that innovation is about bringing together the different actors in industry, in government, in academia, and ensuring they work together effectively, rather than just trying to focus on individually strong actors. Uh, from market failure to system failure. I'll come back to that point later on. So these are some of the things which we've learned over the last 50 years. And in looking forward, 10 of my advances are couched in similar terms, from something to something else. So that's the first 10. And the other five represent more general challenges to the field and its researchers. Uh, so that, I should apologize here, there's only time for 15 challenges. If it's a longer lecture, you get 20, but if I'm keeping it to 40 minutes, you get 15. So the first one, from visible innovation to dark innovation. Well, what do I mean by that? The way we conceptualize innovation, define it, measure it, that was set up as the field began to emerge 40 or 50 years ago. Um, and at that stage, when people talked about innovation, they first of all thought of manufacturing, and within manufacturing, they thought of largely technologically based innovation. So they developed indicators to measure this. So things like how much do you spend on R&D funding, how many researchers are involved, how many patents are produced. These are all very pertinent when you're talking about that sort of innovation. But today, those indicators are missing large amounts of innovative activity. Two or three years ago, I went to OECD, the think tank in Paris, for a workshop which was called The Changing Geography of Innovation. And I thought, well, that's where we'll find out about all these things happening in China and Vietnam and Latin America and so on. Well, actually the data, with perhaps the exception of China, don't show a lot of evidence of the changing geography of innovation because we've got these somewhat old-fashioned indicators. And it was clear from talking to people from Vietnam, China, Argentina, Chile, wherever, that there was a lot of activity going on around the world, innovative activity going on, that was just not being captured in our current indicators. Innovations that are more incremental than radical, that are not in the form of manufactured product innovations, that involve little formal art research and development, that are not patented. Examples of this, a lot of incremental process innovations going on in factories in China and other emerging uh, markets at present. Financial innovations, we've had some big financial innovations in recent years, I'll come back to those later on. Organisational innovations, social innovations, again not captured by traditional metrics. So I draw an analogy here with cosmology. With our telescopes we can only observe about 5% of the universe out there, the other 95% is either dark matter, it doesn't shine light so it can't be seen by telescopes, or it's the more mysterious still thing called dark energy. So similarly with innovation, we've got some things we can shine light on, that's visible, but a lot of it is dark. Challenge here, to conceptualize, define and devise methods for measuring, analyzing and understanding all that dark innovation. Number two, and I should say these are uh, um, 
I'm using fairly provocative language here to get you thinking about the field. So from boys' toys to mundane but liberating innovations. What do I mean here? Well, many of the top names in our field made their names in the 1980s, 1990s, when the focus was on high-tech manufacturing in industrialized economies. That's where the game was. It was the US versus Europe versus Japan. What was the empirical focus of their work? Well, you can do a simple analysis. Uh, so I, here I am using Google Scholar, which you may be familiar with. Okay for this sort of thing, not necessarily very reliable and systematic, but good enough for my purposes. So I'm punching in the keyword innovation and, and this is the number of papers in the journal that I'm one of the editors for that you refer to, Research Policy. So 717 papers refer to computers and PCs, that's one product. Cars, 280, televisions, 200, cameras, videos, 130, video electric, uh, video games. Hard disk drive, one component of one product. Uh, 40 papers on that, cell phones, 37 and so on. And then I tried to think of other innovations that perhaps over the last 40 years have done more to change human life than some of these things. And these are some of my examples. I'll come back to why in a minute. Fridges, 11, washing machine, 6, vacuum cleaners, 2, washing powder, 2, domestic toilet. Now, why do I mention all of those? And I'm now looking around the room, and I'm pleased to see that we have a fairly even gender balance in this room which was not true 40 years ago, if I'd been giving the seminar then. Why was that? Well, I grew up in the 19... Sorry? He's, he's ahead of the game. This is my friend from university, Richard Kay. Um, yes, in the 1950s, when I grew up, being a housewife was a full-time activity. You would spend, and this was in England, you spend all of Monday, what, Monday was washing day for some reason, part of our culture. You, if you were lucky, you had a primitive washing machine, you put the clothes in, you stirred them round, you then put them through a mangle to get all the water up, you then hung them on the washing line, and then it would rain, you'd bring them all in again, it stopped raining, you put them all out again, you'd dry them, you'd iron them. The whole day was washing day. Another day would be spent cleaning the house. You probably didn't have a hoover in those days, so you'd, I remember taking the carpets out and beating them on the washing line and getting all the dust out. Uh, so another day spent cleaning. Shopping, one of my favorite facts. You had to go to different shops, butchers, bakers, greengrocers, to get a bit of this and a bit of that, and then you had to prepare all the food. The average time spent preparing one meal in the UK in the 1950s was two hours. Who did that? The women, not the men. Now the average time in the UK is eight minutes. One week, oh, once a week you go shopping to the supermarket, put it all in the car, bring it back home, on the day you stick it in the microwave for eight minutes per meal. So what has this meant? Now, one member of the household does not have to spend all the time being a housewife, they can go out and do jobs. So my daughter is now you know, a full-time professional, whereas my mother, who was equally educated to my father, she was the housewife. So this, these arguably have had more effect on our lives than the ones at the top. Um, so a tendency amongst our community, where the big names are mainly male still, but I hope that will change, to focus on boys' toys compared with other innovations that have perhaps improved our lives more. Skewed our search for methodological tools, indicators, analytical frameworks, models, and the ones that we have developed are perhaps less applicable to other forms of innovation. So the challenge here, to give more equal treatment to more mundane innovations that have done or could do more for humanity, whether it's liberating women from the household drudgery, still a major problem in many developing countries, obviously, or the poor from poverty in emerging economies. Number three, from national and regional to global systems of innovation. The concept of national systems of innovation, which I alluded to earlier, is one of the most important to emerge in our field in the last 30 years. But even at the time it was brought forward, it was clear that not all innovative activity is national. Uh, and increasingly, the key players in innovation are multinational companies operating, selling, producing, and indeed are carrying out R&D on a global scale in emerging as well as in industrialized economies, forging links, therefore, between national systems of innovation, linking them all together to create global system innovation. So challenge here to analyze these global systems, their interactions with each other, with national systems, likely to have major implications, first of all, for tackling some of the big global problems, 
fight climate change, but also for the policies that are most appropriate for emerging economies, which will be strongly influenced by these global systems of innovation. Number four, from innovation for productivity to innovation for sustainability. Again, during the 80s, 90s, political and economic agenda, Washington Consensus, Thatcherism, Reaganism, etc., dominated by concerns with economic competitiveness, productivity, wealth creation. That's what it was all about in the 80s and 90s. Innovation seen as key, and that led to emphasis on policies to stimulate innovation that would achieve those things. Little concern at that stage with uh, sustainability. So again, the concepts, indicators, models that we produced earlier on may not be appropriate to today's world where in, uh, sustainability and climate change and things like that are much more important. Again, that's reflected in the empirical focus of papers published in research policy. Here you can see the figures and until recently, a lot less emphasis on sustainability rather than productivity. That began to change in the late 1990s, first of all in the Netherlands, uh, increasing concern led to a few scholars there, like Johan Schott, René Kemp, Frank Gales. Um, they became interested in innovation for sustainability. They drew upon work by our neighbours in science and technology studies to produce work on things like socio-technical transitions, strategic niche management, multi-level perspective and so on. That's starting to have an impact, but there's still a lot more to be done before we complete the transition to green innovation, which we're probably going to need if the world is to survive. Number five, um, from innovation for economic development to innovation for sustainable development, what do I mean here? Well, despite the considerable achievements of the last 20 or 30 years in removing hundreds of millions of people in China and other emerging economies from poverty, there are still billions yet who have to benefit from these uh, economic uh, advances and from the innovations. And this poses a challenge for the innovation studies community. And my colleague, Bent Arka Lundfall, has been at the forefront here, uh, how to link innovation <coughs> studies research to development economics more broadly. And he's associated with something called Globelix, which you may have come across, which is very much trying to do all this. Uh, they've made some progress, but still a long way to go. So challenge here to develop the conceptual, ethological, and analytical tools to facilitate the shift to innovation for sustainable development through appropriate policies. Again, <coughs> that's at the heart of what you're working on here in your institute of um, emerging um, market and, and economies. Number six, from risky innovation to socially responsible innovation. Science, technology and innovation have been essential in improving economic and social conditions over de the previous decades. The most obvious example of that is life expectancy. Um, during the 100 years from 1900 to 2000, life expectancy in industrialized countries went up from 50 to 80. And it's still increasing at a similar, perhaps slightly reduced rate today. What that means is every day you live, your life expectancy increases by a further five hours. That's a phenomenal rate of progress. And technology has been part of that, technology and innovation. But it's also brought risks and unintended consequences, damage to the environment, adverse effects on the quality of life. Um, and there are some who argue that technology has led to an increase in the overall amount of risk that we're subject to. This is the Ulrich Beck thesis about the risk society. I don't actually buy that. I think what has happened is that our antennae for detecting risk become a lot more sensitive. So we now know about lots of risks that we didn't know about 50 or 100 years ago. Previous work in our field has addressed risk through things like technology assessment, but more recently, again with substantial inputs from our neighbours in science and technology studies, there's been work on things like constructive technology assessment, public understanding of science, ethical, legal and social implications research, precautionary principle, and now, more recently, people have begun to talk about the notion of responsible innovation, i.e. avoiding some of these risks, building it in at the start rather than finding out about the risk later on and then adding on some patch to, to deal with that. So some begun to respond to this challenge, still much to do in coming decades to move to socially responsible innovation. Number seven, from innovation for wealth creation to innovation for well-being. This is a broader issue for centuries Human progress has been seen in terms of more is better. It's been assumed that more things, more money, more whatever, is better. 
Um, and when it comes to elections, often elections were decided, as Clinton or one of his advisors said, in the basis of the economy. The economy. Uh, what's it all about? The, the, uh, what's the exact phrase? It's the, economy. it's the economy, stupid. That's the phrase that won Clinton the election, basically. Mm -hmm. Or what, what, what he saw as driving. So we've been driven by politicians trying to increase GDP or GDP per capita. Um, and the assumption that more wealth and more stuff is, leads to better life is probably true for most of human history. But does it still hold true today? Um, again, this is reflected in the focus, the empirical focus of studies in our field. So here, same sort of thing, Google Scholar Search, research policy papers, wealth and profit far more than one's concerned with well-being and so on, until more recently when it began to pick up. Now, there's a number of problems with this. Research on well-being suggests, first of all, the assumption that more is better is true only up to a certain income level, maybe twenty, thirty thousand dollars per head, something like that. This is the so-called Easterlin paradox, although it's much debated by economists. But certainly, secondly, we know the world cannot support a population of nine or ten billion, all with American economic living standards. So something has to give. And I feel that the political economic, and economic agenda, and indeed our very notion of human progress, must change. Uh, we've got to shift, therefore, from innovation for wealth to innovation for well-being. That needs policies to stimulate that, implies the development of appropriate methods, indicators, conceptual frameworks again. Work begun by a few, but again, we need to build on this if the shift to innovation for well-being is to be achieved. Which brings me on to the eighth one, from winner take all to fairness for all. Polarized, this is uh, Bentanko Lundval again, who I mentioned earlier. Polarization and growing inequality seem to be inherent in the globalizing learning economy. And certainly in the last 20 or 30 years, we've seen growing inequality within countries, even as they've grown very rapidly economically. And what we're, as part of that we're seeing is a growing instance of what's been called the winner-take-all phenomenon. In other words, one organization benefits from innovation to a far greater extent than competitors with only marginally inferior products or uh, services. Prime examples in IT, Microsoft, Intel, Oracle, Google, Facebook, and so on. Now, our field is certainly not to blame for this, but are we complicit in some way? And I would argue that we have some moral responsibility here. We can't simply claim it's not our fault that these innovations are used in this way. We have some moral responsibility to discuss it and, and perhaps explore how policies might be changed. Uh, to bring about these broader changes. So a duty to explore whether we can say something about how firms might generations that instead of creating a few billionaires in Silicon Valley, actually result in greater fairness for all around the world. And people like Lundval and Carlotta Perez have been writing in recent years about how we might set about doing that. Ninth one, and again this might be quite topical in Hong Kong, giving Carrie Lam's talk yesterday, Seeing governments in not so much as fixtures of market failures, but in terms of being at the heart of the entrepreneurial state. Under the prevailing ideology of the last 20 or 30 years, various characterized as uh, the Washington consensus or Reaganism and Thatcherism and so on, the government was seen as playing a very restricted role. Its task was to ensure that the macroeconomic climate was basically working okay, so that the free market could then let rip and then governments could get out of the way. And indeed that's the basis that Hong Kong operated for, very successfully for 50 years after the Second World War. And where a contrast was drawn between the public and private sector, the public sector always got all the nasty uh, adjectives, public sector lumbering, bureaucratic, inefficient, public se private sector always seen as nimble, efficient and entrepreneurial. But that actually, if you look at the history of things, underplays the entrepreneurial role of the state with regard to crucial innovations. Many in the pharmaceutical drugs, microchips, internet, World Wide Web, cell phones, GPS, these began life in the public sector with government funding. Only later on did venture capitalists and the private sector begin to come in when the risks were smaller. Uh, so government has always been quite entrepreneurial, although the ideology of the last 30 years has downplayed all of that. Now some say, well, governments can't pick winners. Often they end up picking losers, like Concorde and supersonic transport, or. Um, uh, earlier, Carter tried to get uh, sustainable forms of energy in that policy one. Well, yes, government policies will not always be successful, but it's unrealistic to assume that all policies will be successful. I draw here an analogy with research. A lot of research that we academics do is unsuccessful. Indeed, if you're always doing projects as successful, you're probably not doing very advanced research. 
We also know with entrepreneurial initiatives, well, what is the percentage that fail? It's a very high percentage. Most of them will be unsuccessful. And I think we have to accept the same thing with government policy. Some of them will work, some of them won't work. Governments have to take risks. If they don't take risks, they may not have any failures, but they won't have great successes either. So in other words, we need to change our conception of government from the fixer of market failures to the entrepreneurial state. And I think there were hints of that in Carrie Lam's speech yesterday, which I hope will be pursued by you and by others in Hong Kong as you map out Hong Kong's future for the coming decades. Number 10, from faith-based policy to evidence-based policy. Um, underpinning the philosophy of the people who created our field, and this is people like Chris Freeman, who set up SPRU, Dick Nelson, who's still going strong. His first paper in this field was 1959, he's still active today. Uh, Nathan Rosenberg is a key person as well. They all had this philosophy or assumption that science, technology, and innovation are fundamental to economic and social progress. But for the full potential of science and technology and innovation to be exploited, we need effective policies at government level, and we need effective management within the corporation. And that's what they set out to do. And they assumed that um, better, the work we did would lead to better policies, uh, with uh, more evidence-based policies, and that would lead to greater benefits for humanity. Now then we've run into a problem. When we've gone off to policy makers in the last 20 or 30 years offering evidence-based policies, but as you suggested, <coughs> we've often found that politicians are only willing to take on board things that already support what they want to do anyway. Uh, in other words, they're looking for policy-based evidence, not evidence pointing to a different policy. And indeed, as a field, although we've had 20 or 30 years of working at this, we've actually got little systematic evidence about whether our efforts have led to better policies, and those policies have led to the world becoming a better place. This is a, a big gap, if you like, in what we do. So providing such evidence and encouraging a further shift to evidence-based policy is another crucial challenge for the field of innovation studies over the coming decades. So that's the first ten. The next five are rather different in character. And again, they're deliberately couched in provocative terms to get you thinking. I don't want you to agree with all I said, but I want you to think about what are the challenges the field faces and how might you contribute to it as you work out what you're going to do with the rest of your lives. First one, pricking academic bubbles. So what do I mean by this? Well, we know from economic history that in the past there have been periods of unbridled optimism, often giving rise to a bubble. And here are some of the prominent examples. Dutch tulips was a period in Dutch history when everybody wanted to invest in the latest exotic tulips that were being brought in by botanists from all around the world. And fantastic prices ended up being paid for tulips and still suddenly that bubble burst and tulips were worth virtually nothing. In the UK we had the South Sea bubble where everybody ploughed their money into a South Sea company and then suddenly that went bankrupt. Then we had the canal building mania in the late 18th, early 19th century, and then the railway mania. The US stock market, market bubble in the 1920s. Now unfortunately, we're not very good at learning from these bubbles. So we then had the dot-com bubble in the 1990s. And then more recently, we had the feeding frenzy around financial derivatives in the early 2000s, which eventually all bust up in the crisis of 2007 to 2008. Now you might think that as scientists, as academics, we are intelligent, rational actors, we're immune from all of that. Well, I'm not sure that we are. If you look at theoretical physics at present, there are thousands of people working on string theory. What's come out of string theory? Not a lot, I would venture to say, although obviously string theorists would debate that with me. Uh, a few years back, a lot of social scientists plowed into chaos theory and then complexity theory. Uh, what's come out of that? Well, some work, but not a lot, I would argue. Even in our community, innovation studies, we sometimes have fallen prey to such manias or bubbles in the past. So, in the 1980s, we were all getting very excited about Japanese production processes. Just in time, total quality, zero defects. We thought these were the secret of Japanese success, which at that stage was carrying all before it. Uh, more recently, perhaps we've been guilty in our community of hyping things like IT and biotechnology and saying these are the future for everybody. Or we've perhaps exaggerated the benefits of clusters bringing together small companies, universities, big companies in clusters. Or exaggerating the innovative potential of SMEs. There is a lot of work on this and maybe sometimes we've gone overboard on it. 
So a challenge here to younger scholars in our field to maintain the ability to assess if a popular line of research is becoming a fad. We, in other words, we need a few contrarians willing to suggest that the new emperor has no clothes on occasion. Number 12, avoiding disciplinary sclerosis. Initially, 40 or 50 years ago, the field that I worked in was largely populated by people who did their first degree and their doctorate in other fields. Uh, and then they came into the field, so it was always intrinsically interdisciplinary in nature and driven primarily, as I mentioned earlier, by policy issues. And largely qualitative in those early days. We didn't have a lot of data, so we had to do qualitative work, lots of case studies. Now we've moved on. We have our own dedicated centres. I come from one of those, Science Policy Research Unit. We train our own doctorates in the field. We have our own journals, like Research Policy. We have our own conferences that we go to. We have our own methodologies, which are increasingly quantitative. We do fancy things with uh, patents and with community innovation survey data and so on. And so our field is beginning to exhibit some disciplinary characteristics. We're not a discipline yet, we don't have a paradigm, for those of you familiar with Kuhn, we don't have a body of theoretical work that we all line up with. Uh, but there may be signs of an embryo paradigm beginning to emerge. Uh, but all of that has come at some cost. There's increasing homogeneity. Because we train our doctoral students, ourselves, They've all read the same things. And to some extent, they all think like their lecturers. Um, more paradigm driven. So now younger researchers are thinking, well, we start from what we already know, and then we make some small incremental advance from that. And they, and some of them are less driven by the challenges out there in the policy world. And arguably, although this, this may be just me becoming old, uh, less adventurous than it was as a field 40 or 50 years ago. And I draw an analogy here with economics and what's happened in economics faculties. Are there any economists in the room before I start being rude about it? <laughs> no, okay. Uh, let's try and po pose it as diplomatically as possible. 40 or 50 years ago in economics departments you had a range of economists. Development economists, labour economists, institutional economists, industrial economists, Marxist economists, uh, economic historians. Now, increasingly, in economics faculties, you find the macroeconomic macro uh, economists with their models, their fancy maths, and not a lot of other things. The others have been driven out. And I draw an analogy here, and this is an analogy from the animal kingdom in the UK. In the UK, we used to have red squirrels. And everybody liked red squirrels. They were friendly animals that were up trees and appeared on Christmas cards and so on. Then in the late 19th century, some fool introduced from North America larger, more aggressive grey squirrels, which attack the red squirrels and they've driven them up. So there's now only red squirrels in the north of England and in Scotland. The rest of the UK has these large, aggressive North American grey squirrels. And so similar thing has been going on here in economics, is that, that's my analogy. But it poses an inter interesting question for my field, innovation scholars. What sort of field do we want to be? Do we want to become more academic, more like a discipline with all these characteristics, our own paradigm and so on? Or do we want to remain an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary mongrel driven by policy problems in the real world? Problems which always require bringing together different disciplines to address them. So do we want to be a disciplinary pedigree or an interdisciplinary mongrel? And I'm using terminology here from the dog kingdom. Uh, some of you may be familiar with Cross Dog Show, who's got the prettiest pedigree dog. Uh, well, they win prizes, uh, economic prizes in the case of economics. Um, but actually, the pedigree dogs are incredibly stupid because they've been crossbred over generations. It's the mongrels who are the intelligent ones. So you can see which side of the uh, question I come down here uh, through my choice of pedigrees versus mongrels. Number 13, identifying the causes of the economic crisis. Recent economic crisis, most serious since the 1930s. Causes, innovations played a major part. Mortgage-backed securities, collateralized debt obligation, credit default swaps, these are innovations. Uh, they were introduced to reduce risk, so for perfectly good reasons, but then they spiraled out of control in the 2000s and ended up with a trillion dollar casino banking. Uh, that brought about the crisis of 
Now the problem here is that not that my field contributed to these, because we didn't. In fact, we just didn't study them at all. We didn't provide any analysis. I can't find any papers on this from my field on financial innovations. There were perhaps one or two exceptions. And, and interesting, our neighbors in STS, sociologists like Donald McKenzie, have more to say about financial innovations than innovation scholars. So the curious incident of the dog that failed to bark there, the quote from Sherlock Holmes. Challenge here to provide an understanding of the role played by financial innovations in creating the economic crisis and the lessons one can draw to minimize the risk of it happening again. Which leads on to number 14, helping to generate a new paradigm for economics. So I'm having a go at economics here again. Um, here's Lundvall, so a quote from him. The economics profession has a major responsibility for the crisis of 2008, 7-8. There's a strong need for a paradigm shift. And Giovanni Dossi is another person, another field, person from our field who's written about this. And Dossi's pointed to an analogy with Ptolemaic astronomy. So what do I mean here? Well, to the ancients, it was axiomatic that celestial bodies were perfect and the perfect bodies have to move in circles. Well, actually, and so here is the Earth at the center. Here's the sun. Over here, I think, is Mars. Venus is up here. But they don't actually move in perfect circles. In order to square the circle, you have to draw these epicycles to explain the motion of these celestial bodies. So the analogy here is with economics. The classical economics seeks to protect its core beliefs in equilibrium, rational agents, perfect information, efficient markets, representative firms. These are all some part of the cherished assumptions of economics, but actually the data don't always stack up against that, so they've had to invoke a growing panoply of ad hoc fixes, bounded rationality, imperfect information, information asymmetry, satisficing rather than optimizing, cognitive bias. Now those of you who've read Thomas Kuhn know that the accumulation of anomalies like this is often a prelude to the end of normal science and the dropping of one paradigm and the shift to a new paradigm. And that's what I'd like to see in economics, and I think there's an opportunity here for our field, along with others, like behavioral economics uh, and ecological economics, to introduce an evolutionary element to uh, the economic paradigm. Last one, very different, maintaining our research integrity and sense of morality. Um, why do I say all this? Um, professional communities during the 20th century tended to operate on the basis of self-policing. It was assumed that external regulations were not necessary. But then in the UK, and I don't know about here, but certainly in other European countries, we had a succession of scandals involving doctors, accountants, Enron, uh, MPs claiming expense accounts for maintaining the moats in their stately home, for example, bankers, uh, all of which suggest that self-policing is not adequate. Uh, now, is academia one place where self-policing is still okay? Can we operate as a republic of science where misconduct is still rare, low level and self-correcting. Uh, in our own field, we were fortunate with our founding fathers, I mentioned Freeman and Nelson earlier, they had shaped the culture, the norms, the values of our field and these were people with great openness, intellectual generosity, great integrity. But there are now warning signs in our field and across academia of things beginning to go wrong of growing secrecy amongst academics, people not willing to give their ideas at conferences because they think somebody will steal them before they and publish before they do. People borrowing data from other people and not acknowledging it properly. Uh, problems with plagiarism, um, and I can tell you more about that if you want, but as an editor of a journal, this is a growing problem. People lifting chunks of papers out of other people's work and putting it in their own papers. Rare although question mark, because we don't know what's the underlying level, we only know what we've detected. Um, but a growing problem with salami publishing. Academics under pressure to produce more and more publications in top journals. Some of them then cut corners. And instead of producing one paper, they divide it into two or three chunks and try and sell those bits to different journals. Now, question, how many papers can you get out of one study? There's no hard rules on this, but some people take it too far. We had one doctoral student in Germany, very good doctoral thesis, interviewed lots of people, lots of data, lots of variables, produced 24 journal articles before people realized actually these were all rather similar and indeed overlapping, and one paper's contribution actually affected the contributions being claimed in other papers. That, unfortunately, that guy who went from 
uh, doctoral student for a full professor in Germany in six years, when this was discovered, lost his job. So don't be tempted. But problem here, where is the boundary between acceptable and unacceptable research behavior, how to maintain it? So those are my 15 challenges. Um, and if you want to read a bit more, oh, sorry, it's a concluding remark, sorry, before I get to the video free. Field 50 years old, time to look forward, discuss future challenges, that's what I've been doing. What sort of field do we want to be? I've argued that the focus of our empirical work is not always been keeping up with the rapidly changing world in which we operate, uh, with the shift from manufacturing to services, with emerging markets, with sustainability. We tend to ignore things that we can't measure with our existing measurement tools, i.e. dark innovation, things like financial innovation, we haven't got a handle on those yet. There's an opportunity here to shift economics, perhaps to a better, more effective paradigm. Need better understanding of the interaction between what we do as policy researchers and policy makers who take decisions in government and industry. Uh, and we need to maintain the vitality and integrity of our field innovation studies. So there's a list of 15 challenges, not intended to be prescriptive, but to get you to start thinking about these, engaging in the debate, and that debate may then shape our future over coming decades. As I say, here's some references if you want to read further. I'll leave the slides with you to circulate as you see fit, uh, but I'll leave the, uh, the 15 challenges up as we move into questions and discussion. Thank you, Robert. Yes, yes. Right. And I won't stand in a lot. Yes. If you were to think for the last past 10 years, we are talking about how like microwaves and stuff have like changed our life because of the global warming phase, but which thing would you say has been the biggest problem? Well, so the microwave is not the, just the last 10 years. I was talking about trends from the 1950s through till now. Many of the innovations that have been introduced during that time have changed tasks in the household, which previously were done by people we described as housewives, to things that can now be done much more quickly and efficiently, with the result that women can now pursue full-time careers, whereas my mother was not in a position to do so. So that's a change that's gone over on over 50 years, not just the last 10 years. For the last 10 years, and I think I hinted or said this, from, in my view, the innovations which have had most impact on the world unfortunately not in a very good way, are the financial innovations, which were originally introduced, like most innovations, introduced for perfectly good reasons, to do with reducing and managing risk more effectively. These were, you know, uh, that, that was the original intention. And for the first few years, that's how they were used. And then smart people, often with a scientific background, these were so-called rocket scientists, the very good physicists and mathematicians and computer scientists produced by universities like this got hired by the financial institutions because they paid higher salaries than anybody else, went off, did fancy things, and produced ever more complicated things, collateralized debt obligations, credit default swaps, and so on, which even the people trading them didn't really understand, let alone other people in the banks, let alone other organizations that ended up buying them, such as municipal counties in the US and you know, other people who shouldn't have been buying these very complex financial instruments. Eventually this spiraled out of control and the financial world, as we know, more, more or less blew up in 2007-8 and governments had to ride in. This is very much against the ideology of free markets to rescue banks and other institutions, insurance companies for example, which have become too big to fail, to use the jargon. So something went very wrong there with those financial innovations. And I'm pointing out that my community did not study those innovations sufficiently and certainly did not provide warnings in the early 2000s when they might, with the benefit of hindsight, they might have been saying more, more, giving more warning signs and maybe the crisis would have not happened in the same form that it did. Yes. If those columns belong to shape the paradigm, the problem is, is how to predict a new paradigm going back to the future. It is very easy to manage the economy, but it is very hard to manage the sustainable development. 
You're right there. What has been driving a lot of this process in economics is the belief that economics has to get more like a hard science with models, with maths, with statistics. Uh, some people have said this is economics trying to be more like physics. That, that has been the driving force. And in the background of all of this, you've had the Nobel Prize Committee for many years dominated by Chicago school economists. So many economists feeling, well, I want to be the best economist, I want to win a Nobel Prize, that's the sort of economics I should be doing. So that is, as you say, being discouraging work in areas where it's much harder, if not impossible, to get models and mass and statistics to grapple with issues like uh, development and, and sustainability and so on. And somehow or other, we've got to break that. Now, I didn't have time to go into a great deal of detail about the evolutionary economics, but that is work which Nelson and Winter produced around 1982, I think it was, which is a rival, potential rival paradigm for economics, which is very much an evolutionary model for how the world operates, rather than a world that supposedly is based on equilibrium and optimization. They say, no, the world is based, it's continually changing and out of equilibrium, so it's the precise opposite of the starting point. That book on evolutionary economics has been incredibly highly cited, incredibly influential in other social sciences, apart from in mainstream economics. The mainstream economists just continue ignoring it. So I'm making a plea that they have to give greater attention to a different way of looking at economies, which is more evolutionary, and if you like, more based on the biological world than the physical world, uh, and that may be a better way forward for economics than the, the way that it's been pursued for the last 30 or 40 years. Okay. Right, the next question is here. Talk, uh, uh, I, I think your point that most of the uh, uh, metrics to measure innovation are, are big and old, like r and spending and millions. Uh, what, in your opinion, do you think would be some of the modern measures to uh, measure the uh, emerging market innovation? Well, here, I think that what is necessary is what was done back 40 or 50 years ago. People have to go out there and talk to companies and watch what they're doing and devise new methods and new data. Now that is hard work. What people tend to do today, because we're all pressurized, academics as well as everybody else, is we think, what can we do with existing databases? So we've got databases on funding of R&D, on scientists, on patents and so on. Let's do fancy things with these. So there's an analogy here that I draw with, there's a famous cartoon about the drunk in the street looking for his keys. I don't know if you're familiar with this cartoon. Anyway, the drunk is looking for his keys underneath the lamppost. And the policeman comes along and says, can I help you, what are you looking for? And the drunk, in a rather slurred speech, says, well, I've lost my keys, so I'm looking for them here. And the policeman said, well, did you drop them here under the lamppost? And the drunk says, no, I dropped them over there in that dark area. So the policeman says, well, why are you looking for them here? And the drunk says, well, that's where the light is. Well, to some extent, that's what we're doing now in our field. We go where the data is, rather than doing the hard work, going out talking to companies, visiting factories in China, finding out what are the innovative activities they're engaging in, and how can we get a handle on these and start measuring them and building models and new approaches and so on. So I would encourage you, if you're thinking of becoming an innovation scholar, put in the hard work. It'll be risky, but be bold, and that may pay off in the longer term, rather than just following in the footsteps of your supervisor and doing more incremental things with existing databases. Yes? So, um, 
going back to financial innovation and the method some research can cost, do you think the economic crisis may be the way research is being conducted and implemented has changed in the sense that risk is more like, analyzed? And if you have any examples or cases where which research has been conducted but it hasn't been implemented or put into place because the risk of what it may cost was too high or maybe some controversial discovery to be done and not put in this paper yet. Well, I'm not familiar with the situation out here in Hong Kong, but in Britain, yes, the notion of risk <coughs> is now a lot more prominent in government than it was 20 years ago. And one of the things that the government chief scientific advisor, we have a government chief scientific advisor who advises the prime minister and the whole of government, and then within each department we have a chief scientific advisor within that department. What the government chief scientific advisor, aided by all these departmental government uh, uh, scientific advisors have done, is set in place something called the National Risk Register, which has a whole range of risks, epidemics, the next flu coming out of Chinese chicken or whatever, uh, the threat of being hit by a meteor, the, head, the risk of a financial crisis. Uh, they've got a National Risk Register, and as you know with risks, there are two things you have to worry about. One is the scale of the risk, and the other is the probability that it might happen. So there are some which have a very big scale. If we're hit by a big meteor, we're all dead. But the chances of that are pretty small. Whereas the chances of flu, next type of flu that we don't have resistance to, that's quite great, but you know, hopefully not too many people will die. So you have to put together the scale and the, the probability. So yes, come back to your question, there has been a lot more work on risk, and it's had some impact on policy. And now, for example, at Cambridge, there's a a professor for the public understanding of risk. In other words, how the public respond to risk and how you should factor that into the policies as you take up. Public, we, we actually as individuals have a very irrational approach to risk. If it's imposed on us, we get very twitchy. But if we impose it on ourselves, even though it's quite risky, we will do it. So Richard and I will ski down hills at great speed and probably at great risk to our heads. But if we travel on a train or a plane, we expect that to be risk-free because that's in hope we have no control over it. So there's a lot about the psychology of risk that's been worked on and to do with the public understanding and reaction to it and how policies therefore have to be taken out of that. Yes? Okay. Briefly, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, secondly, uh, I have a question related to you mentioned about sustainability and social responsibility in the mention of the great contribution of the science and technology studies on yeah. I myself actually is very interested in this field, but I um, would like you to elaborate a little bit more about the kind of um, maybe innovation studies and other standard courses, because I find sharp comparison between these two disciplines for innovation study and more, and more like it takes innovation as granted for a really positive thing that yes. people should uh, people and policy should change for it, but actually for SDS, it holds a natural, critical uh, kind of view to science, technology, innovation. So it's a big, sharp comparison. I like yes. to understand more about that. This is a very interesting, indeed, a very topical point. Um, topical because a month or so ago at one of the big conferences for STS is the 4S conference in the States where thousands of people from all around the world, from sociology, history, philosophy of science, come together. And a colleague, Alan Irwin, organized a session to talk about the changing relationship between SDS and the field that I'm in, science policy and innovation studies. Uh, and just a little digression. Back in the 60s and 70s, these two embryo fields were indistinguishable. There's people were working on both bits of it, people like Chris Freeman and Derek Toller Price and so on. But then in the late 70s, 80s, 90s, the fields grew apart. And we actually got quite rude about each other. So the STS people thought that we were positivist technocrats giving answers in terms of technology to decision makers in government industry that we sold our souls, as it were, to the elites. We thought they were all social constructivists and you couldn't make any sense of what they were saying because they couched it in impenetrable language. 
It's only in the last few years that the two sides have begun to talk to each other again in a big way. First in the Netherlands, where actually they didn't grow apart so much during this period, but more recently in other European countries, and maybe also starting now in the US. And interesting things are beginning to happen. And that's an important point. If you look back over intellectual history, often the big, most radical advances come not at the mainstream of disciplines, but when two or more fields bump together, and then interesting things happen, where people from different perspectives come together, <coughs> realize they've got a common issue, but approach it from different perspectives, with different tools, different methodologies, different theories, that's when exciting developments take place. And I sense that that's begun to happen with SDS and Science Policy and Innovation Studies over the last 10 years, with things like uh, sustainable sustainability, strategic niche management, and so on, and more re recently, responsible innovation. I think with that we'll have to call it a day. I'm sure the rest of will be happy to take questions afterwards, but uh, let's uh, give a round of applause.